Why do 80% of Americans live east of this imaginary line while only 20% occupy the western part of the United States? Within that 20%, more than 50 million people live in just three states, California, Oregon, and Washington. That means less than 6% of all Americans, about 18 million people, are spread across a third of the mainland U.S., a region that's sparsely populated and full of open spaces. For perspective, the New York metropolitan area alone includes over 23 million residents. So what's this imaginary line all about? If you look at North America's satellite images, especially the nighttime ones, you'll see a line that cuts the country in half. The eastern side is green during the day and lit up at night. However, the western side looks like it's almost uninhabitable. And that's not far from the truth. The most highly populated area in the west is the coast. This is where practically all of the largest cities in the western U.S. are located. Nearly 4 million people live in Los Angeles, a little more than 1.4 million in San Diego, about 2 million combined in San Jose and San Francisco, and over 775,000 in Seattle. And then we have a large piece of land in the middle of the states with only a few big cities that are scattered across the darkness. In fact, nearly half of all the 30 million people living in this pocket have chosen to call one of only eight cities their home. Boise, Salt Lake City, Denver, Las Vegas, Albuquerque, Phoenix, Tucson, or El Paso. And if you ever meet someone from the central part of the United States, there is a 30% probability that the modern day cowboy or cowgirl lives in Las Vegas, Phoenix, or Denver. But people notice the difference in population distribution long before most of these cities were built. Back in 1878, an American explorer and geologist, John Wesley Powell, established this boundary. The line, or the 100th meridian, has since then been considered the divide between the western plains and the moist eastern United States. It runs from pole to pole through six states, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Now, of course, the difference won't immediately hit you once you step over the meridian line, which you can totally do, by the way. But those who have ever driven across the country know exactly why the explorer came up with such a divider. When you cross the split somewhere between the 98th and 100th meridian, you'll notice how everything around you changes. You'll see the difference in the climate, the scenery, and even the infrastructure. In fact, some parts of the central U.S. are so far apart that you might have to drive for 100 miles to reach the nearest gas station. On the other hand, those living in the east can often find the nearest McDonald's only within a short four-mile radius. In states like Kentucky, the average distance to the Golden Arches is 3.83 miles, while in Wyoming, it's 9.81, and in South Dakota, it's 15.23. But why did this happen in the first place? Why did people decide that it would be better to settle in the eastern part of the U.S.? The answer is pretty straightforward water. For example, Abilene is only a jump away from Dallas, but the rainfall difference is like night and day. While Dallas enjoys over 36 inches of rain each year, Abilene's rain gauge only hits around 25 inches. As you might have already guessed, Abilene is located west of the 98th meridian, just like Midland and Amarillo with 15 and 20 inches of annual rainfall respectively. And while these cities often suffer from drought, Dallas, Oklahoma City, and plenty of others are located only a few hundred miles away. But to the eastern side of the 98th meridian receive almost twice as much rainfall every year. But why is the climate so drastically different? If you look at the U.S. precipitation map, you'll see a really striking difference between the two halves. It's almost as if a giant has just decided to slice the land into two pieces. And the truth is that this is actually pretty close to what really happened. In our story, though, the mighty mountains are the ones who did the slicing instead of some giant. The great Rocky Mountains, to be exact. The Rockies are one of the longest mountain ranges in the world, stretching an impressive 3,000 miles from British Columbia in Canada to New Mexico. They're home to some incredible peaks like Long's Peak, 14,259 feet, and Mount Massive, 14,428 feet, both located in Colorado. The tallest peak in the Rockies is Mount Elbert, which stands at about 14,439 feet. 
Now, while researchers can't quite agree on whether the Rockies or the California mountain ranges are the main cause of the dryness in the central United States, it is clear that these ranges play a huge role in shaping the continent's climate. The Rockies cast a gigantic rain shadow. In a word, it's a dry area that gets formed simply because the mighty mountains are blocking rain-producing weather systems. In our case, it's the Pacific Ocean. The ocean brings a lot of moisture, so in theory, it could have made the middle of the states a lush oasis. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen because of the Rockies. The moist air coming in from the ocean has to get through this enormous obstacle. But as the air goes higher up into the mountains, it cools down, condenses, and leaves behind plenty of moisture. By the time the air hits the eastern slope, it's already dry. To make matters worse, these dry air masses start drawing moisture from the surrounding landscape. That's how the territories between the Rockies and the 98th Meridian get robbed of almost any rain, not once, but twice. The situation on the eastern side of the continent is a whole different story. Here, the biggest mountain range is the Appalachians. And while this highland system is considered to be among the oldest on our planet, the range is most certainly not as formidable as the giants on the west. Mount Mitchell, the highest peak of the Appalachians, stands at only 6,684 feet, which makes it over two times smaller than the highest peaks of not only the Rockies, but also the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada in the west. As there is no wall blocking the moist air coming in from the Atlantic Ocean, all the rain gets brought right to the eastern part of the U.S. without facing any obstacles. In fact, there's so much moisture in the region that the agricultural production in the east is historically rain-fed, a luxury that is almost inaccessible for the states located between the Rockies and the 98th Meridian. So, one of the main reasons why the central third of the states is home to only 18 million Americans is because the territory simply doesn't have enough water. Climate is probably the main reason why there's such a big difference in population distribution, but moisture isn't the only thing that the Atlantic Ocean brought to the continent. It's time to look at how European colonization shaped North America. Centuries ago, thousands of colonists and their families joined the competition among European countries to use the distant land. In 1607, the English started the colony in Chesapeake Bay. A year later, the French built Quebec, and the Dutch tried to make a permanent colony in the area that later became New York. All these colonies popped up on the East Coast because it was simply closer to Europe. And actually, all 13 British colonies that were set up in the 17th and early 18th centuries are now part of the eastern United States. By the 18th century, the colonies had become more connected. Roads were built and coastal shipping increased, making it easier to travel between the territories. But trade wasn't the only thing that made the colonies so appealing. For example, seven colleges were established, including Harvard, the oldest institution of higher learning in the United States, founded in 1636. The colonies were growing up fast, with culture, politics, and the economy all getting better. That's what made the area attractive to folks looking for better opportunities. But while the eastern seaboard was growing fast, the area to the west of the 100th meridian was still rural and not very friendly. Throughout the years, as the cities on the coast grew bigger and roads and railroads were built, the differences between the two areas became even more obvious. So what's the point in moving farther west if you got it all here in the east? Big cities, a nice climate, loads of jobs and trading opportunities? Because that's what the American dream is all about. By the way, the British were also trying to do everything they could to stop the American settlers from moving westward. They were worried that if the colonists crossed the mountains, it would be tricky to control taxes and trade. So, in 1763, the British government announced the Royal Proclamation, which basically said that the Appalachian Mountains were the border of the 13 colonies. Any travel or settlement beyond the mountains would be illegal. But then, the colonies became independent. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson coughed up $15 million to buy the territory of Louisiana from the French government. This purchase doubled the size of the United States. Jefferson believed that independence and virtue went hand in hand with land ownership, especially the ownership of small family farms. As a result, 
many people began leaving their homes in the East in search of economic opportunity. But the project of westward expansion was always doomed to fail, and it had two main government programs to thank for that, Jefferson's Land System and the Homestead Act. Jefferson's system was all about having these big square patches of land that were all the same size. That might have seemed like a good idea in theory, but in reality, it ended up isolating families on their farms. It also destroyed the whole idea of developing towns and led to people on the plains going crazy from loneliness. As to the Homestead Act, the government gave people false hope. Thousands ended up settling on tiny plots of land in areas with poor soil and extreme weather. Many died, some gave up and went back east to the factories, and even those who succeeded often had to take advantage of others to make it work. The act scattered too many Americans to the wind. At this point, the invisible line that divided the country into two parts was no longer a small gap. It turned into an abyss between the economically developed regions full of agricultural land and the unwelcoming central part that turned the dreams of way too many people into dust. However, in the last century, technology has managed to change the way our planet looks. It's like we're living in a whole new world now. The technological transformations have begun to challenge both historical and geographical constraints in ways that would have seemed impossible to American settlers. We now have smart irrigation and air conditioning systems that make life even in the driest parts of the states oh so much easier. With that being said, to this day, the eastern USA is continuing to benefit from its amazing geographical advantages, despite all these new developments. But it looks like that won't be the case for long. The line dividing the humid and dry halves of the states is slowly shifting further to the east. As you might have noticed, I have been referring to both the 100 and 98 meridians in this video, and there's a reason for that. Way back when John Wesley Powell established the wet boundary, he correctly used the 100th meridian as the geological marker. Today, nearly 150 years later, the divider has already shifted to around the 98th meridian, and it is going to continue moving as our climate rapidly changes. Cities that usually get a lot of rain are going to slowly start drying out. Most farms won't be able to count on natural irrigation any longer, so it'll be impossible to grow water-hungry crops like corn. The economic damage is going to be huge. Now, you might be thinking that a shift means that things would change in the West as well, and perhaps to the better, but that's highly unlikely. In fact, it looks like the already dry part of the U.S. is going to face even more droughts. The Colorado River, the main source of fresh water in the West, is already drying up due to a combination of chronic overuse of water resources and a historic drought. To tell the truth, its flows have declined by 20% over the last century, and it is only going to continue to get worse. But at the end of the day, the story of the Invisible Line is about how well humans are able to adapt. For hundreds of years, people have been searching for places to live peacefully and thrive. And as the divider will keep on moving, it looks like there's only one thing that we can do, and that is adapt yet again.